Hello, hello everyone. Hello and thank you for being with us um, this evening. Welcome to um, the Samuel E. Kelly Lecture. Thank you for being with us for um, this 2002 lecture featuring Dr. Ali Mokdog. His lecture is Health Disparities in the United States, Drivers and the Path Forward. I'd like to begin with acknowledging place. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. I also acknowledge and honor the tribal nations across Washington State and the many indigenous peoples from across the country who also live and work in Seattle and the surrounding areas. By doing so, I affirm the original caretakers of the land and I affirm tribal sovereignty. The Samuel E. Kelly Distinguished Faculty Lecture was established in 2005 and named in honor of the UW's first Vice President for the Office of Minority Affairs. The annual Samuel E. Kelly Distinguished Faculty Lecture is dedicated to acknowledging the work of faculty whose nationally recognized research focuses on diversity and social justice. The first lecturer was Dr. Quintard Taylor from the UW Department of History, presenting from civil rights to black power in the West, the movement in Seattle from 1960 to 1970. Last year's lecturer was Dr. Charlotte Cote from the Department of American Indian Studies on indigenizing the University of Washington lessons from Washlabot Intellectual House. So you see there's a range uh, of scholarship that we want to celebrate. Dr. Samuel E. Kelly was hired as the first vice president for the newly formed Office of Minority Affairs in 1970. Also the first African-American senior administrator at the UW, Dr. Kelly was an educational advocate who opened doors for hundreds of underrepresented students at the university. Many of the programs and services that he established during his six-year tenure still exist today. Among his accomplishments were securing funding to house sites, both for the Ethnic Cultural Center, remodeled and uh, renamed in his honor in 2015, we just left there, and the Instructional Center in 1971. Dr. Kelly passed away on June 6, 2009. I am now pleased to introduce Terry Ward, Director of Health Sciences Center Minority Students Program and Chair of the UW Seattle Black Opportunity Fund. The Health Science Center for Minority Students Program supports underrepresented minority and disadvantaged students interested in health science, biomedical, or behavioral graduate or professional opportunities at every stage of their university career. Terry is a long time um, OMAD staff member um, being here uh, for, she looks like a baby, but she's been here. I'm not gonna say how long you've been here, but she's a dedicated um, a member of our team um, and does great work in support of our students in the community. So Terry. Thank you for that warm introduction. Thank you, Ricky. So tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing from one of the world's leading experts in public health research. Dr. Ali Mokdad has published more than 550 articles and numerous reports, including his groundbreaking work on local level disease trends and some of the leading risk factors for poor health. His work on obesity is among the most highly cited in the field. He is a professor of health metric sciences and the director of Middle Eastern Initiatives at the University of Washington Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, also known as IHME, and also chief strategy officer for the UW Population Health Initiative. Prior to joining IHME, Dr. Mokdad worked at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in numerous positions. 
and directed the CDC Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, the largest standardized telephone survey in the world, allowing public health agencies to monitor risk behaviors relating to the leading causes or more excuse me, of morbidity and mortality in the United States. Dr. Mokdad has received several awards, including the Global Health Achievement Award, the Department of Health and Human Services Honor Award, the Shepherd Award for Outstanding Scientific Contribution to Public Health, and the Warren J. Matofsky Innovators Award from the American Association for Public Opinion Research. Tonight, he will be sharing with us his lecture, Health Disparities in the United States, Drivers and the Path Forward, where he will outline the urgent need to address the shared underlying factors driving widespread healthcare disparities and the path forward to improve population health in the US. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ali Mokdad to the podium. Good evening, and thank you, Terry and Ricky, for the introduction. Thank you, everybody, who's made this available uh, for all of us, setting me up, everybody, and um, you taking the photos. Uh, I want today to talk to you about health disparities in the US. What is driving them, and what we need to address them, and how we can move forward. Uh, before I proceed, I would also like to acknowledge the original takers, uh, caretakers of the land and then honor their culture, whether here where we stand in our state, in our country as well, and respect their culture and their heritage as well. And I would like also to honor Dr. Kelly. Uh, and I know Ricky talked uh, about his achievement, but what, what a visionary. I mean, he served the country in the military role. After he finished his service, came here at the University of Washington, got his PhD, became an educator, and opened the doors for so many underserved students to come here and get a pass forward. It's very important to remember that, that he has made a major impact on a lot of people all over this country. I want to with all modesty, very hard to come after Dr. Kelly, but I want to tell you briefly who I am. Uh, I, I was born in a village. The photos about the village are recent, uh, not black and white when I was born. It's in mountains of Lebanon. It's a farming community. We're apple farmers, and we grew what we ate. Uh, my parents are illiterate. My grandparents are illiterate. I remember when the road came to my village. I remember when electricity came after the road. And water, piped water, came to my village when I was already in college in Beirut, Lebanon. So I'm going to talk about the history of disparities in the United States. It's very important for us to address disparities, to understand the history here, what has been done before. Where are we now? And I want to talk, what action can we take, and how can we make sure that these actions are long-lasting and lead to a progress? And what is the UW doing? And it's very, I'm so proud of being part of the UW and what the UW is doing to address health disparities. But before I start, and I want to start in a way that's the main message of what I want to talk. And so the bottom line is up in the front. Usually people talk and give you a conclusion at the end. I recommend, I'm going to do it at the beginning. We need to spend less time in this country describing health disparities and designing programs and policies to solve them. Stop counting. We have enough data to act. It's very important to remember that. Equality is not the same as equity. That's very important for all of us to remember that. If we want to be in a, provide and attain health equity, we have to do it more than equality. And it's very important to remember that. Biological determinants are important. Yes, genetics you know, could predispose certain people, for we know that. Science tells us that somebody having certain genes is at higher risk of getting breast cancer. But we haven't changed the genetic makeup of this country. We still have a lot of disparities. So what's really important are the social determinants of health, and we need to address them. 
It's not genetic, it's social determinant of health. There is bias and there is racism. They're real, unless we talk about it, unless we address it, we're not gonna be able to move forward. It's very important to remember that. And we need a strategy to be inclusive and make sure whatever we do, excellence in population health, how, especially at this university, how we train the next generation, the next leaders, and we need to integrate all of this in what we do, whatever we do in our research and our education as well. So let me talk a little bit about the history of this health disparities in the US. This is more than 20 year, 120 years ago. Studies that were published, 500 pages. I mean, this is before epidemiology and computers, before social media. If you look at it, well done, and I'm, as an epidemiologist who can judge studies, well done. Documented health disparities showed that life expectancy is much lower for African Americans in this country. And they have higher uh, overall mortality 120 years ago. 1915, you know, Booker Washington had a presentation and a conference how to improve the life of black people. And he talked about 45% of all deaths among black people were preventable. This is in 1915. Much more mortality, sickness, and you know, he even related to money, chased the money. He looked at the cost and said it cost at that time $100 million in our 2019, that's about $1.9 billion. And then after that, there is a history of reports in the United States about health disparities. I'm listing some of them here. You know, 1975, you could see a huge list, people talking about health disparities in the United States, measuring it, saying what it is, and what a big problem it is in this country. There was a health report in 1983 that was provided to the Congress in 1984. In 1985, there were, uh, Sorry, I'm, in 1985, there was a Secretary of Health report. At that time, it was nine volumes with a lot of scientists that at that time participated in that report. 290 huge effort. Documented health disparity in this country showed that we have a problem and we need to solve it and we need to do something about it. And it's very important to remember that. When we talk about health disparities, this is not something new. This has been going for a long time in this country. And for the longest time since it has started to happen, we also have been documenting that there are disparities and they need to be addressed. Nine volumes. The all executive summary alone was 239 pages. So where are we now? After all what I showed you, we talk about it in the United States more than anybody else. Where are we right now? We have a contract from the National Institute of Health at IHME, and we're working on it. And you're looking here at life expectancy. The bottom line is for American Indian, Alaskan natives. And you're looking from 2000 to 2019, no improvement in life expectancy. Nada. We acknowledge their contribution, their heritage, their culture. No improvement in life expectancy. Look at the African Americans, there was improvement until 2010, is leveling since then. You look at white and the country, because the white are the majority, so the black line is the national one. And you look at Hispanics, they do much better than white, much better than African Americans, much better than Native Americans. But again, at 2010, that progress has leveled, and it's not increasing anymore. Asian and Pacific Islander, and I need to be very careful here when I say Asian and Pacific Islander. They're two separate groups. Pacific Islanders have much worse life expectancy and health. We don't have data right now in the United States for me to split them. In surveys, I can't, and we're spending a lot of time to be able to split that. So that's what you're looking at at health here in the United States. And when you look at life expectancy, and this is at the county level by race ethnicity, for the United States. And you look at the total, black, Latino, white, American Indian, Alaskan Native, and of course, Asian. Shouldn't call them Asian and Pacific Islander, Asian, because they're the majority here. But let me put it in perspective. 
The highest life expectancy in the world right now is about 86 years old, a little bit over 86 for a Japanese woman, okay? So we have people in this country that if have a higher life expectancy than a Japanese woman, where we have people in this country where the life expectancy is what we see in many countries in Afghanistan, where we see in countries where they have term oil. I hate to make this comparison, but it's very important for us. If we want to be serious about it, 69% at the total level, everybody, 69% of the counties have a lower life expectancy than Cuba, 54% than Iran, and the two countries that we had political problems with. When you look at black in this country, 87% have lower life expectancy than Cuba. 87% of the counties have lower life expectancy than Cuba. 82% less than Iran. Again, comparison is not fair, we shouldn't be doing this, but it's very important to understand where we stand globally and how we are falling behind and how even as a country we are falling behind, many people within our country are falling behind. And when you look at progress from 2000 to 2019, I'm going to explain this one. I'm looking at the top on the right. You're looking at within the same county, each circle is comparing black life expectancy to white life expectancy. So the line would be, they should be the same, so everybody will be on the line. The improvement is exactly the same. What you're looking at here is for African Americans in most of the counties, their life expectancy in that period increased more than that of the white in the same county. However, they're still behind it when it comes to life expectancy, and you look at it, some of them are like 15 or 22 years behind the life expectancy of white in the same county. When you look at Native Americans and Alaska Indians, not improvement compared to the white, much lower improvement, and of course, they're much lower in terms of life expectancy falling behind. When you look at some of the conditions, so I'm looking at ischemic heart disease, I'm mean looking at uh, uh, ischemic heart disease. To put it in perspective globally, in many countries in Europe, in Japan, it's declining. Mortality is declining in many of the Western countries. Blood pressure medication, cholesterol, access to quality. And you could see huge patterns of mortality that's jumping from about 14 to about 500 and almost 600, huge disparities. And you look at black and white, there's some patterns southeast, and you could see, see that there are many people are way ahead of everybody else, and there is a huge disparities in this country. But this is one of the number one killer, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of mortality in the United States. But let's look at HIV AIDS, much worse in terms of access and quality of medical care for African Americans. Well, you see a lot of difference in terms of mortality rate for African Americans and black in this country compared to everybody else. And you see it, it's in certain geographic area, we could see where they are and we know exactly what's happening. And then when you look at HIV in this country, I mean, it started in the affluent communities when we had the medication for it, it moved to communities, you know, rural communities, and it's stuck there. And it's not anymore a problem where it started in San Francisco or in California. I mean, that, that should be a lesson for us. When you look at different causes of mortality, the main, what you're looking at here, and I know this is too much, but what you're looking here, there's always the same pattern. Black have a higher mortality rate. American Indians have a higher mortality rate. There are some exceptions, very few. You know, COPD is higher among white. And you could see some of them, that's the implication, which is very important to keep an eye on. This one, unintentional injuries. That's Katrina. Why, why would it affect, you know, it affected everybody, but why would it affect black more than everybody else? Again, all of these are very, and I'm showing you data till 2019. I'm not showing you what has happened right now with COVID-19, where we know minorities, black, Hispanic, Native Americans were more likely to die from COVID-19. And then when we publish this, everybody in, you know, in this country, again, 
failing to address health disparities and the root cause. We're saying, oh, they have higher risk factors. That's why they have higher mortality from COVID-19. Well, look at it, that's not true. The highest mortality is among 35 to 44 and 45 to 54, working age groups. They are the people who kept food on our table, kept our country running, we failed to protect them. And there are studies that showed that once vaccines came in and masks became available, that gap in mortality declined. Still, it was much higher, but it declined. Again, we failed to protect our essential workers. And I'll come and talk about COVID as well more in this period. Look at money. We spend more money on health than anybody else, much more. And then even as our payment increased from on health, 2014 to 2017, life expectancy is declining. And you look at other countries, Chile, you know, they spent you know, fraction of what we spend. Look at the life expectancy is way better than our life expectancy. The debate should not be that we're spending more money on health. I mean, somebody has more money than I do, their house would be more expensive than my house, their car would be more. Are you, are you getting the return on investment on what you're spending? That's the debate. Let's look at other indicators. There's something we do at IHME we call health access and quality of medical care. If you look at the ward and we rank the ward, and this is taking certain conditions that if you have good access and good quality of care, nobody should die from them or mortality will be very low. Appendix, nobody should die from an appendix if you have access to and good quality medical care. So Iceland ranked number one in the ward. We ranked number 29 in the world, this, this country that spent the most money, the richest country in the world. Thing that's very important for us here as a university, we do something called the Human Capital Index. And it's very strong predictor of economical development. And this is the people who are old 20 to 64, probability of dying in this age group, this is your working force, how healthy they are, and how educated. Two indicators of education, years of, education and also learning from national and international tests. The United States we rank 27. And then our rank is falling behind. So it's very important to keep that in mind, even when it comes to education and health for our workforce, we're falling behind everybody of our competitors. So the conclusion, what you're looking at, and it's very sad, but that's the reality. Disparities are the norm. They're not the exception in this country. It's norm. Whenever I do a study, that's norm. You know, that's the norm. Should we accept that? No. And health disparities are real. And in many places, they're getting much worse, especially if you start looking at the geographic by race and by location. Huge disparities will appear here in socioeconomic status. What's driving these health disparities? I mean, let's acknowledge that. Socioeconomic inequalities, income, of course, education, we know that. Lack of financial access to health care, insurance, or even many people who are insured, they're underinsured sometimes. Their insurance doesn't pay for preventive services. Poor quality of medical care. But when people talk about medical care in this country, people assume it's medical errors. No, 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 no. Medical care is totally different. It's how long from the you're having symptoms of something bad, how long did it take you to go and seek medical care and get the attention you deserve? Somebody who's been having signs for a heart attack for a long time and then take a long time to go to the medical doctor, by that time, the situation is getting worse. That's one. Two, once you are in the medical care, how well are the institutions and the doctors that are taking care of you, following you up to make sure if you have high blood pressure, blood pressure is controlled if you are on medication. That's very important. Yes, we have disparities in that in this country, for sure. And the last one are the preventable risk factors, your smoking, your diet, physical inactivity. And when you look at, in terms of health care here in the United States, this was published by the National Healthcare Quality and Disparities Report. This is in 2019. And you look at it, 40% of quality measures, black and American Indians receive worse care than white. I mean, this is in 2019, after what? 120 years talking about it. For more one than third of quality measures, Hispanic received worse care than whites in this country. For nearly 30% of quality measures, Asian received worse care here than everybody else. This is systematic and going on for a long time. 
then we have all the science says, unless you include in your risk factor when you address a patient or when you go to a community, unless you include social, uh, social, social demographic, uh, social demographic, social determinants of health, you're not going to be able to deal with the problem unless you understand the deck of card where somebody is coming from, what you're basing your recommendation for them, what you're asking them to do. You have to base it on what where they are from. And, that, you know, and you'll see some examples in, in the lecture. Unless we do that and we look at the person and we look at where they come from, what's really causing these problems, and it's not the same for everyone everywhere in this country. So what actions can we take? That's the reality of this country. That's the equality of this country. That's what equity is, but that's what justice is. And it's very important for us to remember that. And you know, one of my favorite people in, is Maya. And you know, you may encounter many defeats, but you must not be defeated. It's very important for us. And in fact, you know, the encounter, this experience may make you a better person. I love that. You know, I've been kicked a lot in my life where I came from, and I fell down and I stood up and I kept going, don't have time to dust myself. But you know, People are sick and tired of being resilient. That, I mean, it's not acceptable in a country like ours that we keep telling the people, you know, you're going to face problems, you have to get up and keep going. And yes, many people do that. That's their only option. But again, we need to do better than that. So what, what are the issues that we need to look at? We need to tackle systematic institutional and structural racism. We need to address unconscious bias. We need to address the social determinants of health here. And we need to have targeted action in order to get some solution. Let me talk a little bit more about that. And we need, again, to look at the person and where they come from, their education, their healthcare access, their economic stability. Before we give a recommendation, before we say do something, with COVID-19, we told people go and get a vaccine. First, we didn't include the minorities in the research of the vaccine. I said, we dropped this as a vaccine, go and take it. That's one. Two, when you get the vaccine, if you are paid hourly, are they going to pay you what to take a leave? And then we knew, all of us, that when you get the vaccine, you're going to have side effects. The next day, you may not be able to go to work. Who's going to pay you to do that? Also, during the COVID-19, everywhere, you go and register to get the, you know, Again, talking about figuring out the system and navigating and getting go to get the vaccine. But even when you go there to get the vaccine, they ask you about your health insurance. Vaccine was for free, asking you about your health insurance. Many people were like, oh, you're asking me, when, then I have to pay for it. So again, there are a lot of issues in the community, agriculture, work environment, your living conditions. And before I move on, I'd like to give, you know, allow me to give a couple of examples. I have a wife and a daughter, most of you know that. Both of them have curly hair. Both my wife and daughter would refuse to go to a hairdresser unless he or she have a curly hair. Or the population they serve has curly hair. I mean, very simple. So why would this not apply to everything else? Why wouldn't this apply to medicine? You know, why would my wife go to somebody to treat her unless she knows this person knows my problem? and will understand where I'm coming from. The other thing important is we have a study in Salud Mesoamerica Initiative where we monitor this native population, indigenous population in Mexico, Chiapas, Mexico. In our survey, one of our interests was to increase, the, improve the service in the facilities. And for indigenous population delivery, they like to deliver standing up. That's the culture. So they built these facilities where you could deliver standing up but no takers. So we were supposed to see why there is no demand. I mean, the supply is here, why the demand? So we did a survey, and we added in that survey several questions. One of them is, did they give you a blanket when you came to the facility? That question was a stronger predictor for prenatal care, for antenatal care, for delivery in the facility. Blanket, you know, they have blankets. You know, they can come with a blanket. It was the respect. It was the way they treated them. It was the trust that you are one of us, you're going to treat me equally, and I believe in you. And we published during COVID-19, countries that, are, that performed the best are countries that had trust in the government. 
Again, we need to address these issues. We need to address these issues when we talk about disparities. What we need to do, know the data, of course, we have plenty of the data, I said, but we need to find out the disparity population. What are the conditions that are causing these disparities? And they vary from one location to another. We need leadership in order to make sure we get this action and we get the support for us to do it. And we need to identify, and I'll talk more, strategies using proven effective interventions. Set the goals, create friendly competition between services. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more. Engage the community, very important to engage the community. Very important to engage the community early on. Don't go to a community and say, I know your problem, and let's, you know, I'll tell you what you need to do. No, their priority may be different than your priority. They know they have a smoking problem, they have their diet, but, but their priority may be something else. I've had that at CDC, I worked in North Carolina, I worked in Ethiopia, where the priority of the community is totally different than what we are coming to do. And again, we have to listen, we have to involve them. We need partnership across all disciplines because what we are dealing with is very hard to fix in one solution. It has to come from everywhere we do. And that that's, partnership is very important. We need to audit ourselves and evaluate our work. It's very important for us. What's not working, we should not invest in it. And of course, once we succeed, spread it, spread the word, tell people, this is what we did here and this is the situation, you can apply it. How could we make it long lasting? We have to have active community engagement and, and partnership. I keep repeating certain things throughout this uh, lecture. We need strong leadership. We need to, leadership has to show up in this community and say, I am devoted to work on this. I want to do it. I want to help you to do it. And then deal with an implicit bias. And all of us have, you know, I'm not African American, I'm not Native American, I'm a brown person, my name tells you I'm a Muslim, my accent tells you I'm an, you know, I'm an Arab. You know, after 9-11, you travel with me, I know a lot about statistics, the probability of me being randomly picked for a search, uh, that's not random, it doesn't fly. We need to deal with that. Uh, we need to have a strategy for preventive care. You shouldn't wait for people to get sick and treat them. Yes, we need to treat them if they get sick, but we need to make sure that we do. And keep in mind, there is a huge difference between our knowledge and practice. Usually it's about 17 years. There is a lot of studies that show that. It's still maybe coming a little bit less. But I know when, when I was at CDC, I worked in global health. We had flood here. Many babies died and parents didn't know, and even physicians, about oral rehydration solution. We travel as CDC, they used to give it to us when we are going out in a mission. So there's some knowledge that it takes a long time to get to people, the rich and the affluent will get it immediately. And, and it's our job to eliminate that and reduce it. Let's talk about it when it comes to so many factors here, but we need to start early on in life. And we need to follow it. We shouldn't wait when somebody is adult. We know there are adver adverse impact on your health when you are a very little and very small baby, and we need to address that. And then when we talk about community and here, in this country, what you hear some of our health officials will tell you, you have the best medical system in the world. Yes, I am, you know, I'm here at UW. We have the best hospital in the world. Yes, one of the best hospital in the world. But for people who can access it, for people who live next to it. And that's not how we solve the problems of disparities through health care only. We need to do that. But let me give you an example. My mom, open heart surgery, has a lot of health problems. She has a cardiologist, you know, is a relative, trust the guy, you know, it's like her. We do a good job, the, myself and my two sisters, she goes at least to see her physician every three months. That's half an hour, maybe because she knows him, you know, he's married to her niece, they talk a little bit more, let's say one hour. That's four hours a year. Take out the amount of mom sleeps every night, that's 0.0 what, 2% of her time interacting with the physician. The rest of her time, she's in her community. That's what she's dealing with. And that's what we need to do. We need to go to these communities and we need to work with them. 
And there is now a lot of work on Best Buy, WHO, DCPN was proudly done here at the University of Washington, where the Best Buy for each of the risk factors, how we deal with it. You look at cost and effectiveness, you pick something that has low cost but high effectiveness, you shouldn't pick something that's really very costly and it's not effective. And then we should have promote these, there are a lot of publications, a lot of evidence that say here where you need to invest and how you invest in it. So, what, what we're talking about when it comes to three phases of disparities, you're detecting it, defining the vulnerable population that's out there, measure that disparities, what's driving them in each community. Remember, they vary from one place to another. And then, of course, look at the confounding factors. You cannot tell somebody a solution that will work for everybody else if you don't take into account where they're coming from and their deck of cards, what they're dealing with. Understanding, you know, there's patient and the individual provider, there's clinical encounters, and the healthcare system, how to make it easy, how to navigate the system, was in, uh, even in this country. If you're not educated and if you have low income, you know, God helps you to figure out and navigate the health system here in this country. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. Then intervene, evaluate, and of course, translate, translation and implementation, and change your policy and program. Now, people, I want to pause here before I finish. People tell you, well, that's very difficult to do, Ali. You know, it's going to take us a long time. Well, let's look at Australia. If you listen to politicians, I have a cousin who lives in Sydney. If you look at politicians in a debate in politics right now in Australia, it's not about providing child care. It's who is debating who can do it better. It's not should we do it or not. The debate is who among the politicians who are running who could do it better. How can they do it? Gun control. Drinking and driving in Australia. Why? I mean, same country, white population came in, native population, they have disparities. Why are they able to do, improve their life expectancy? And there are lessons. No, this can be done. If we decide to do it, it can be done. It can be done. It's not complicated. But are we willing to do it? That's the question. Do we want to do it? So let's, let's talk about it, what we need to do and how to do it. Focus on Reducing socio-economic inequalities is very important, very important in this country, and I told you, human capital index, economical development, our country to compete with other country. You know, people tell you, some politician, we want to make this country great. Well, yeah, education and health. But focusing on preventable risk factors is the most important one and the most likely one to give you the best return on your investment. Why? We published that in JAMA. Uh, we looked at socioeconomic factors, we looked at behavior factors, obesity, physical inactivity, smoking, hypertension, and diabetes, and we looked at medical care, insurance, quality of medical care, physicians per uh, 1,000 1, population. And when we put it in a model, so 60% of the variation in life expectancy, you have to be very careful, in life expectancy, were explained by socioeconomic only. 74 by risk factor, when you put it all together, 74%. What it means, Socioeconomic factor is extremely important for a lot of things. I'm talking about life expectancy here. But it's manifested through the risk factors. If we intervene on the risk factors, who is more likely to benefit? People who have lowest socioeconomic status. And then we have a target to fix it, and we can fix it. How to do it? Given the diversity of the risk that we have here in our community, there is no simple solution. We need to acknowledge that. We need local experiments. Now, in public health and population health, the word experiment is like, ooh, we can't experiment on people. I'm not saying experimenting on treatment. I'm saying if we have a program to reduce obesity, let's try different programs and see which one is working. That's very important. And fund innovative strategies and document through independent evaluation what works to work. During the COVID-19, I was you know, talking to media a lot because what IHME did and projection COVID-19. And I had students from UW, I had two kids, I'll give you one example, called me and said, you developed an app on our phone that if somebody is coughing can tell you if they have COVID or not. And we want to validate it if you allow us in the hospital to figure it out. I mean, brilliant ideas. We need to fund this innovation and I'll come back to talk about innovation. And many leading risk factors that we are struggling with here among minorities in this country, they need the involvement of the medical system. And then now we say we have the best medical hospital or the best physician, 
We need to change the notion of we have the best hospital at the University of Washington, not only taking care of patients, taking care of the community. That's very important. So you're a good hospital if your catchment area is healthy, not the patient who walks through the door and you give them a treatment and need to include physician in our preventive program. And we believe that I publish a lot at CDC that the physician tells you lose, you know, stop smoking, they're more likely to attempt to stop smoking. So what, what is the UW doing? And let me talk a little briefly about the UW. Coming together to improve population health and well-being here. And you know, we have a wonderful president here. It's a privilege and honor to work with her. Very dedicated and on fire all the time, and it's very hard to keep up with her. <laughs> and she came and challenged us, all of us here at the university, there is no reason for us that your place of birth, what I showed you, should determine how long you live. You guys could do better, work together, get together and do it. So she launched a population health initiative, which is a broad, camp, uh, broad concept that not only, you know, making you healthier, we want you to flourish, we want you to live longer and healthier, but it has a lot of intersecting and overlapping factors that influence your health that we need to address. That's environment, socioeconomic factors that we've been talking about, mobility, urban planning, access to technology. And we view population health as your health, environment. I don't mean environment only climate change. I mean the environment around you to support you if you decide to live healthier, supports you to do so. So here, one of the examples when we take, a, you treat a patient, you need to take into account their background, their socioeconomic, you know, telling somebody, Eat a healthy diet and exercise. You know, easier, easy, easy to sell. But when it's 7 p.m. and it's time for dinner and you can't get on a bus and go long distance to buy fresh fruits and vegetables that are very expensive, at the corner, getting a hot dog and buns for your family is the easiest option. It's very important. So it's the environment. If I decide to live healthier, is the environment supporting me to do so, and it's very important. And of course, social and economic justice. It's very important for us. Population health is about social justice, and we need to remember that. So we've done a lot of initiatives here. We brought people together, and you know, as a faculty, I tell you, the hardest thing is to get faculty to work together, not because they don't want to do it, because the way we are set up, for my promotion, I have to publish in my field, I have to get a grant in my field, and that's how I show up. To, you have to make it easier. So we had joint hire, said you could hire jointly. We gave you money towards your retirement. We did like convening and matchmaking. I met people at UW when I came here. We were not on campus. I met people and conferences that are doing something that's very related to what I'm doing. And then I could have called somebody in another university to work me on that grant. There's no way for me to meet them here. So we had to create that list of what people are doing and how they are doing it. We do courses, about 3,000 to 4,000 students every year uh, take our courses in population health. Let me tell you, we're very competitive. I mean, yeah, we don't show it at UW. But yes, I, in population health as a chief strategy officer, I want the best engineer to come out of UW. I was the best doctor to come out from UW. Yes, I want that. But at the same time, the best lawyer, but at the same time, I want them to know they have a bigger role to play than only in their field. They are a piece of the puzzle, and then it's very important for them. We had a lot of lectures about population health. We had the humanitarian and response certificate. You know, proudly, we've done a lot of work in that. We've done research, uh, applied research fellowship, social entrepreneurship, other education. We created this partnership with a lot of institutions. If you are an outside person outside the Europe, I'll tell you, I've been here for over 15 years. I still don't know everybody in the UW and what they do. I have to admit that. If you're an outsider, you want to come here and work with us at the UW, it's very hard to navigate the system. We planted a flag. We're not it, we are one of it, but you could come to me in Populations Initiative and I can take you and I can introduce you different departments, different programs that here that you could work with. And as a vote of confidence, when the president uh, launched the Population Health Initiative, we got this nice building and you know, center. We moved IHME, and I'm here. Now I interact with people every time. We have space for people to come from outside. And that was a vote of confidence from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that we believe in what you're doing. We've done a lot of uh, 
grand challenges, a little bit of money. You know, I talked about innovation in order to improve health. So we're practicing what we are preaching here. We've done rapid response and after COVID-19, economic recovery, and we, have, we did health equity grants. And I'm so proud to be at UW and how the community came together during COVID-19. I've never seen anything like it. Everybody, staff, student, faculty. Funding, to give you an idea, and there is bureaucracy everywhere, and there is bureaucracy at UW. Funding from when we received money and we gave it to people to do the research, and then when the work started, and when the publication came out in a, a record at UW. Within six months to one year, you know, we had a study that has been published, journal articles, and there were so many grants on rapid response focused on seeking better understanding in order to reverse the economic uh, setback that we've had, and many of them were published. There was a lot of publication, and I know I get in trouble. You know, one of you may be somebody who's not here or listening, and I always get in trouble. You didn't mention my study. That's fine, I love that. We're doing a lot of great work. I cannot say all the time, all of it. We partnered with community. We said, you're getting my money to work, you have to have a partner in the community. If you don't have a partner, and you establish partnership in a community, no. It's very important to remember that. A lot of press, you know, many of the news here, was an article or on TV, was many of our faculties who've responded to COVID-19 and improved population health in this. Many of these grants, and we're talking about 25, 50,000 per one, many of them got funded later on. And again, I'll get into trouble because I'm not listing everybody. But the one that's really, you know, some, I worked at CDC. In 2004 uh, was the last time we asked about uh, guns in the BRFSS. We were told if you ask about gun safety, we're gonna take your funding away. The last paper about gun safety in this country at the state level, I published it when I was at CDC. So it was not in order. One of our grand challenges, got money from CDC under the previous administration, it was to prevent suicide and it was about gun control. I mean, how, how proud this makes you that what kind of work we are doing. Now, what's the moonshot that I feel that UW has to do it? I don't like anybody else to do it. I know other universities would compete on that. But the moonshot is for us is to leverage what we have here in global health threat, you know. I meet all the deans, a new dean, we have a new dean of College of Environment here. When I met her, I mean, look, she looked at me and said, Ali, we are about solutions. That's who we are here. We have one of the best colleges of environment. And then they do projections where we're gonna be and they're solution oriented. So we, we want at UW to be the place where we do a comprehensive review of evidence, what works, what doesn't work. That's major problem here, and keep updating it. There are people in ep ep epidemiologists, people in medicine, there's Cochrane reviews every now and then, their specific topic. They don't update them frequently. We need to do this, we need to have the evidence here. What worked, what doesn't work. And not only what works, we want to get what failed, because we don't want to repeat the same mistakes. We don't want another 120 years to deal with these issues and not having the right response to it. And then provide policymakers with prioritization. Say, today, based on your deck of card, based on your situation where you are, this is where you need to invest, and that's the way to maximize your return on investment, giving the resources you have. That's our moonshot at UW. That's a priority for me to do here, priority to work with every faculty, all the deans, chancellor, in order to make this happen. So the UW will be the place where you come for, knowing what's gonna happen for you in 2030, 2040, what's the best solution for it, and if you do it, what's the return on your investment, or how you prioritize your budget to do it today. The second one is what you can do, what each one of us can do. Even small acts in our own community. And then I wanted to talk about something I, did, I do personally. But you know, I, we have our senior management team meeting at IHME and I was sitting next to a colleague and a friend and we didn't know about the lecture. But he told me that, and asked him about his wife, what they are doing, and he said they're working in their neighborhood, they have a swimming pool, white community, affluent community. He's working with his community in order to extend the geography of people who are allowed to use the swimming pool. I mean, he and his wife championing this and doing it. You know, all of us can do something 
that will influence that. And I want all of you, my request to you, as you talk about it's fresh, what I showed you during the holidays, and happy holidays to everybody, talk about it in the dinner table, what each one of, each one of us can do on a personal level not only as a faculty and not only as you do, but on a personal level. From the gardener who's working in your house and has, has not raised the price with COVID-19, looking at them and say, I know it's becoming more expensive. Let's talk about giving you more money for what you do. I want to end up by thanking two people that I uh, have contributed a lot to the lecture. Laura Dwyer Lindgren is the assistant professor who works on the disparity with us. She was my PhD student. She works with me on the contract that we have from NIH on the slides that I showed you. And my dear friend and colleague, uh, George Mansa, he and I worked at CDC. Uh, he was running the cardiovascular disease and we got slapped on our hands so many times. <laughs> we never stopped doing it. He's now at NIH. He's somebody I highly respect, uh, born and raised in Ghana. What a success story. Came here, became one of the best known cardiologists here. And now he's running the center that's very dear to what I, we do. And we, what we want to do is translation and implementation, taking the science and applying it at the community. And I started this new center and they were lucky to recruit uh, George to do this. I want to thank you uh, for listening. Thank you for what you do and encourage you to do more. Thank you. If you have questions for Dr. Uh, uh, Mokdad, please come to the microphone to either side and you can ask your questions so we can hear them. Can I go? Awesome. Hi, thank you for the lecture. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm actually in public polling and I'm in research, so. Um, this was a lovely information, a lot of information, but I was also curious about um, the sampling that you did when you were doing polling about, like, in the research, even though we're talking about action. So I was a bit wondering about, um, you mentioned kind of that um, in the Asian population, there's uh, a very distinct breakdown between Asian and Pacific Islander, and same thing for white, um, you know, white Caucasian versus, uh, like white when Arab Americans are often defined as white in this country, I think always in the census. And I was wondering how you think about um, reaching for polling and reaching for uh, expanding care to populations that are very hard to sample and very hard to reach. Very good question. So uh, you look at like right now, Native American in this country, many surveys will tell you I don't have a large sample size in order to get you an estimate about what they are. Uh, I'm a survey methodologist. I've done a lot of surveys in my uh, career and I still do a lot of surveys. That's, in my opinion, that's an unacceptable excuse. You could do in survey methodology, you could do a survey among Native Americans and you could oversample at any time you do a survey. In polling, what you do, you could also oversample. You have the address-based sampling, you could do it, you can reach out to them, you could involve the community. The worst case situation, you could do what we call snowballing surveys. I mean, you could do it. It's the decision, should I make it or not? You cannot fix a problem unless you measure it. And although I said we have enough to act, but we shouldn't hide behind the small numbers and the ability to reach a community and saying we don't have, we have the resources to do it. We count, I'm sorry, I mean, I shouldn't get into, from the Middle East. This country knows a lot of people in the Middle East, what they are saying, what they are eating, what they are going on a daily basis. <laughs> we can do this for our own population. I'm, I mean, I have, I'm, so I'm in uh, Lebanon. The friends who come to our house who have an Alexa, they say, please unplug it. I was like, but you have a cell phone. <laughs> so, uh, you know, their advertisement in Lebanon, we'd like the CIA, we know what you do. It's about uh, services that are provided for Lebanese. I mean, if we want, we can do it. It's just 
Do we have the decision to make it? And stop talking about it. We debate it. Stop. Let's do something. It's time for action. It's not time for talking anymore. Thank you for a wonderful um, lecture. You talked a lot about social determinants of health. Um, how do we get more health professionals to really focus on social determinants of health um, in their practice? How do we do that? In, in a very good question. If you, if you come like School of Public Health here and you know, even in School of Medicine, nursing, uh, in academia and uh, American Public Health Association, that's very common knowledge and they, they do that and they want to do more of that. The political will in this country, quite honestly, is not there. The funding is not there. I told you we were threatened that we will lose our budget if we ask questions about gun control. And you know, I, I know I'm being taped here, but even uh, when President Bush W. at CDC, we received, you know, in writing, say this person you could fund, this person you can't fund. I mean, organization. So it's not the knowledge that social determinants of health are very important. It's the fact that many people in this country don't want to invest in it. It means I have to give you a social security net, social safety net. I have to give you universal health care. I have to give you universal care for your children. We know what to do. Do we have the political will to do it? And that has been the problem here. We've been talking about social determinants of health since I went to, you know, I said my bachelor degree in biostatistics. I mean, this is not something new. This is not something that we don't know. It's a very strong predictor of your health. It's, I, I can tell you, could, I, right now from the work, we did a study here in King County. For all of us who live here in King County in Seattle, very rich, look at the buildings that are coming up even around our campus. And the life expectancy and health indicators here when, uh, in King County are better than the average. They really perform very well as a county. And then at that time, David Fleming, who was in charge of health at the county, came to me and Chris Murray and said, Ali, you're hurting me, buddy. I knew him from CDC. He said, Ali, you're hurting us. Because when I go to funders within the county, I say, I need money to do it, address diabetes in the south part of King County, they tell me, oh, 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 you're better than anybody else. Why you need it? So we started providing at the local level for him in order to, for him to go and say, I have a problem here. I need to fix it. We know what the problems are. I can look at the zip code and I can tell you the life expectancy because we know that. We know what is determining your life expectancy and your health outcomes. How do we address it? When I mentioned my mom, my mom had her open heart surgery in Lebanon. I was, I was at CDC at the time I, and I went. And I arrived just to be with her for the surgery. And the day that my mom got her surgery is the day where the United States Army went after Saddam Hussein in Kuwait. Okay? So here, somebody who works at CDC, at the, and I have a daughter who was born when we were at CDC. My wife didn't have any leave. We don't. Right now we have leave. We didn't. At CDC we didn't. We didn't have rooms for breastfeeding at CDC at that time. So when I go to settle the bill for my mom, there was in Lebanon in the hospital, there was a sign saying, if you are here for medical treatment and you don't have the money, this is the cell phone number of the attending physician for the Ministry of Health to admit you. This is Lebanon, a country with civil war. How could we afford to treat everybody in our country for free? Now we have the problems, and that's, but at that time, how could we do this and this country can do that? Thank you very much. I know I'm very passionate about this and I talk a lot about it, so thank you very much. Thank you. Well, join me again in thanking Dr. Mokhtad for this amazing uh, presentation. Um, the information he shared is so vitally important um, as we think about how do we serve our communities well, and especially in terms of health. Um, and I think what's so critical is to think about 
equity, that piece what he was talking about, how do you center equity in the work that we do? And so um, I want you to remember, he called us to action to think about what each of us can do to make things better in our community. Um, as we close, we have a gift for Dr. Mokdad, so I want to present you with a, a gift, actually, um, from uh, our very own Emil Petrie, um, is a photographer, and uh, so you have your own Petrie. So well, here we go. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you.